Thank you. And once again, a very, very heartfelt welcome to these beautiful rectangles of love. The overarching theme for this month is service. And the sub themes are uh, sincerity, purity, and uh, integrity. I've chosen truthfulness. So the first one is sincerity. Uh, what does the Quran say about sincerity? There is no definition, but the Quran says, for the sincere is an appointed nourishment, fruits, honor, and dignity in the gardens of bliss, of felicity. So it's very highly valued. But what does sincerity really mean? You know, the closest one can come is, Jamal, can you be authentic? Can you be aligned, meaning your thoughts and your behavior? They are in alignment. So if I look at the traditions, some talk about having an intention that arises not from the ego, but from your higher self constitutes a large part of sincerity. What is my intention? So for example, uh, let's say a politician is fighting for justice of being a great service. What is the intention behind that? If that person, that politician is doing it mainly for becoming famous, getting media attention, then that service that effort, that work in the cause of justice, it becomes weaker. Its vibrations are not as strong. Let me give, give a, a classic example from the traditions. A student, ambitious student, you know, seeks a teacher, a very famous spiritual teacher, and really wants to study with this particular famous, renowned spiritual teacher, but his intention is to become famous, to become idolized. So he asked his teacher, uh, Guru, how long will it take for me to study with you, to finish my studies? You're such a famous teacher. And the Guru says, 10 years. And the student says, now what if I study twice as hard because he's impatient uh, to study twice as hard. How long will it take? And the teacher says, 20 years. So the, the student thinks that the teacher hasn't quite understood what he's saying. He says, what if I study, if I study you know, three times harder, how long will it take? And the teacher says, 30 years. And the student says, why? And the master who understands the student, what he's thinking says, you know, if you're studying with me, you're learning, but you have one eye fixed on titles and fame and power. You have only one eye left to study. You're not being present. You're not being sincere. So let's just be with that. What is my intention? Okay, there's one more all the traditions talk about. It's, it's beautiful, Jamal, that you're sincere. But if your awareness, I repeat, if your awareness is limited, I can actually harm people with my zeal of sincerity. So let me, let me repeat to you that same story which I have said many times, which, but which I have been telling myself and my parents and my parents' parents have been telling uh, throughout the generations a story to meditate on again and again and again. I'll repeat it to you. There is a sincere monkey who goes to neighborhood ponds to pluck the fish out of water to save it from a watery grave. I repeat, ponder on this because this can change. It has changed my life. There is a sincere monkey who goes to neighborhood ponds or lakes to pluck the fish out of water to save them or save it from a watery grave. Sincerity is not good enough. 
it has to be infused with a higher awareness. Just be with that for a few moments. Okay, next one is purity. What does the Quran say about purity? The Quran says, purify, cleanse the innermost dross of your heart. Cleanse, purify the innermost dirt of your heart. What is this dross or dirt on the heart? Or the, let's call it the stain on the heart. So here's another verse on the Quran. The Quran says, Jamal, every time you have an evil thought or a deeply negative thought and you engage in an unhelpful, negative, evil deed, action, it puts a stain on your heart. It puts a stain on your heart. And the, the Quran actually calls it a rust. The exact words of the Quran is, when you are having evil thoughts, you engage in evil deeds, a part of your heart becomes rusted. And the Prophet Muhammad famously said, for every rust, there is a polish. And the polish for the rust of the heart is remembrance of God. Remembrance of God. Can I use God's solvents to polish my heart? to cleanse my heart, to purify my heart. What are these God solvents? Compassion, love, my capacity to forgive, to be patient, to be self-restrained, to manage my anger. You know, in, uh, in Buddhism, uh, the Buddha calls, it, calls these God, what we would call God sol solvents, he calls them virtues. And the beautiful saying of the Buddha, the Buddha says, the perfume of the sandalwood, rose bay, the jasmine, they are beautiful, but they cannot travel against the wind. The perfume of the sandalwood, rose bay, jasmine is very beautiful, very exquisite, but it cannot travel against the wind. But the fragrance of virtues, says the Buddha, the fragrance of virtues travels even against the wind. Travels even against, against the wind and can rise to the heavens. The power, the beauty, the majesty of what we call divine qualities, what the Buddha calls virtues. What about the rust? What is the rust? The Prophet Muhammad was asked, what is it we have to cleanse ourselves? Of course, you know, we know there are many uh, negative things we have to purify ourselves from. What would you say, Prophet Muhammad, are the most important? And the Prophet Muhammad said, pride, greed, and jealousy. Pride, greed, and jealousy. And of course, add to it the ones which really are necessary for you not to be angry, for example, meaning angry, righteous anger is good, but to get into a rage, to contemplate revenge, to restrain yourself, the capacity to forgive. Ah, the Quran says again and again, Jamal, can you be patient? Sabr, can you be patient, patient? So that is why uh, Rumi says, you know, uh, please know this work of polishing the heart to become pure is very difficult. So he has his poetry, uh, you know, Jamal, if you get irritated by every rub, how will the mirror of your heart ever be polished? If you get irritated by every rub, how will the mirror of your heart ever be polished? And this is hard work. Why? Because it involves my entanglement in the material 
earthly world, you might say. Your hands get dirty, literally and metaphorically. So uh, just to explain that metaphorically, only because I love metaphors, here's a metaphor in many traditions, certainly in Sufism, that, you know, the purity of a flower, which is a symbol for spirituality, say the purity of the rose, it is pure, it is beautiful, it is exquisite, it is marvelous, only because it has its roots in the earth. So Jamal, the beauty, the purity of this spiritual rose owes its existence to the mud of daily existence. Okay, one last word about purity. The Quran says, do not attribute purity to yourself. Only God knows who is pure. I repeat, do not attribute purity to yourself. Only God knows who is pure. That is why I love this Sufi saying, the truly purified one is the one who has purified one's Self of the notion of one's own purity. The truly purified one is the one who has purified oneself of the notion of one's own purity. Okay, just be with that for a few moments. Allow that to, well, my favorite words, splash in your heart. Okay, truthfulness, you know, is part of integrity. Can I be, am I speaking the truth, living the truth? And of course, the first thing that Islamic mystics talk about is, Jamal, there is truth, and there's truth of convenience. Which one are you practicing, Jamal? Truth or truth of convenience? Jamal, do you engage in what are called white lies, little lies. It's still a lie, it's not the truth. And the Quran and all the holy books says, the one who engages in falsehood will invariably be exposed. It can never be hidden. Can I realize that? If I am lying, my lying will be exposed sooner or later. It's just the law of the universe. Think about it in your life. So let's revisit that story, which I, 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 I love to focus on. Remember the story? A neighbor goes, knocks on the mullah's door, wants to borrow his donkey. That's done in that part of the world. The mullah does not want to lend the donkey to his neighbor. So what does he do? He lies, makes up an excuse. Oh, brother, if only you'd come five minutes ago, I just lent it to another neighbor. Unfortunately, just at that time, the donkey in the stable begins to bray. The mullah is caught, exposed, found out. And he says, but I hear your donkey braying. And what does the mullah do? Puts his hand on his hips and says, who will you believe, me or the donkey? So the excuse, the lie always gets exposed. Can I become aware of that? Okay, that's one angle. The other angle I want myself to think about and for you to also ponder on is that wonderful saying that there is no need to seek the truth. There is no need to seek the truth. Only stop, Jamal, just stop. Cease cherishing opinions and judgments. There is no need to seek the truth. Just stop cherishing, honoring opinions, judgments, biases, stereotyping. And what Islamic mystics in fact, mystics of all traditions want us to know that we, we are all conditioned. We all have conditioned biases. 
the most liberal and the most conservative. We all have our conditioned biases. So again, a story which I probably have heard seriously at least a thousand times because I've been asked to meditate on that so often, maybe because I didn't quite get it. Simple story of the frogs. There's a well frog spent almost his entire life in the well, if you remember, who gets a visit from his cousin, who is an ocean frog. And the ocean frog tries to explain to the well frog about the ocean. And the well frog says, are you telling me the ocean is half the size of this well? More, more, three fourths the size of this well, more. You don't mean the entire length of this well, more. Impossible, says the well frog. So somehow the cousin ocean frog makes the well frog get out of the well to visit the ocean. And here's another important point. When the well, well frog sees the vastness, the incredible majesty, spaciousness of that ocean, his brain explodes. He can't take it. So what is the lesson here? For myself, and for me to explain to others about something I have a greater knowledge about, about the spaciousness of something is do it little by little. Don't overdo it. Do it in stages. For you to overcome, for me to overcome my own conditioning and to help somebody else to overcome his or her conditioning, prejudices, stereotyping, do it little by little. Understand their story their circumstances, how they were brought up, their relationships, how they have been conditioned, just the way you have been conditioned. Okay, one last point before I move on to Father's Day and we'll do a meditation on Father's Day is about all these things I've mentioned, sincerity, purity, truth. The great mystics say, Jamal, have a sense of spaciousness about it. flexibility about it. It's not about compromising principles. It's about, about having a higher consciousness. So again, the same story, but a, a real life story, which again, probably a few hundred times I've been asked to meditate on about the time of the terrible, distressing time of Nazi Germany, when a family out of love, out of justice, harbored a young Jewish la lady gave a refuge in the house. They, they hid her from the Nazi soldiers. And then when a Nazi soldier came and knocked on the door and said, do you have any uh, Jewish person living in your house? Are you harboring any Jews in your, in your house? And everybody said, no, 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 no. And the soldiers went away. Ah, another questions. The, the, the owner of the house lied, did not speak the truth. Was that impure? Was that insincere? No, because they were truthful, sincere and pure to a higher consciousness, higher ideal of justice, compassion, love. So we are asked not to be narrow in our definition to be flexible, but the word that, that all the great teachers use is spaciousness. And it's between you and your creator. Just be with that for a few moments. A very important point to consider, can I have spaciousness about these virtues? divine qualities. Okay, my friends, Father's Day. So I'll keep it very short and I will, I'm looking at the times so I won't impose on you too much, but what does the Quran say about parents or fathers or mothers? Uh, the Quran says, and spread over your father and mother humbly the 
the wings of your tenderness spread, this is literal and metaphorical, spread over your father and mother, over your parents, humbly, humbly, the wings of your tenderness and pray to your sustainer, oh God, please, please bless them. Bestow, the words in the Quran are, bestow upon my parents, upon my father and mother, your grace. They cherished me. They raised me when I was young. The words of the Quran. But having said that, the Quran also has another verse saying that, but if your parents, father or mother, in your life have led you astray, you have a right, you have a right to disobey them. That's a very powerful statement. If they, if they lead, the words are, if they lead you astray, you have a right to disobey them. But it adds on, no matter what, no matter what the circumstances, but, 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 please do not fail to take care of them in their old age. So just be with that for a few moments. Another question is ask myself and to you, what is your memory of your father who might be living or who has passed away? Was there love? Was there affection? Was there sweetness? Was there a beauty of your relationship? Because if there was or is, savor that. Those are divine, sacred moments. In Islam, uh, the, the teachers mostly talk about, well, quite often talk about the relationship between the Prophet Muhammad and his daughter Fatima. And I repeat this every year. There was a lot of love between Prophet Muhammad and his daughter Fatima. In fact, he used to call her my mother, my little mother. And one day, Fatima was very young, in her 20s. Uh, Prophet Muhammad whispered something into her ear and the daughter burst out shrieking, crying and crying and crying and sobbing uncontrollably. They said, what, what did he tell you? And she, you know, with, with pained heart, she said, my father told me very soon he is going to die. And then just a few days later, he comes again and whispers something else into his daughter's ear, his beloved daughter's ear. And this time she jumps with joy, exhilarated, dancing beyond description, her, uh, her excitement. What did he tell you? He told me, my dear daughter, very soon you'll be joining me. Well, Prophet Muhammad died, as he, as he said, uh, you know, very soon after he whispered, that statement to his beautiful daughter's years. And uh, Fatima, his daughter, was the one who read the eulogy. And every, many Muslims know it by heart, but I just give you one small part. Uh, she said, it is not surprising to me that whoever catches the fragrance of Muhammad's tomb will never want to know another perfume, another fragrance. Destiny has injured me with such a bereavement, so sorrowful, so painful, so dark. Had it fallen on the days, they would have been, they would have been turned into dark eternal nights. And six months after that, she passed away. Anyhow, the point here is to express that beautiful relationship between father and daughter. What was your relationship? If you had happy, beautiful times, please honor them, hold them close to your, to your heart. Those are sacred moments. Okay, the next question is, what have you learned from your father? Parents have so much to teach. What have you learned? that is so precious for you, valuable for you. A 
before I forget, in Islam they say, if your father or mother or loved one passes away, they continue to get married. They continue to get married, married, even though they have passed away. If you who are living on earth do three things for your loved ones. Number one, pray for them often. Number two, pass on a legacy of learning to others taught to you by your parents. Any legacy of learning. And the third one is an enduring charity. An enduring, continuous charity. So I've said this many times. Uh, I pray for my parents every day. I love to share what my parents shared with me in their learning. And every Friday, I do something good, but dedicate that to my father and mother. Okay, so what, what have you learned that you honor, that you're grateful for? So I repeat the same story today, a lot of repetitions of stories. Uh, the 13th century Sufi master, Saadi, who says he never forgot this lesson about the subtlety, subtlety of the ego. And what is the story? The story is that his father, also a very well-known teacher, had hundreds of followers. And every week or every other night, they would do all night prayers. All night prayers keep vigil. And this young boy, Saadi, who I'm talking about, who also became a very famous Sufi master, the young boy at 10 years old would join the father and the hundreds of followers in keeping all night vigil in prayers. But one night, all the followers, they fell asleep. All of them fell asleep. They were so tired. And the young boy turned to his father and said, Father, look at them. Look, just look at them. Looking at, at them, you would think they were dead. Just look at them. They, they have all fallen asleep. They're not praying. And what did the father say? Father said, sweet darling son, apple of my eye, my beloved son, I would rather you also fall asleep like them rather than slandering them. And those words, I would rather you also fall asleep rather than slandering them. That pierced his heart. He never forgot that because it was said with such tenderness, sweetness, but such a sharp message about the beguiling wiles of the ego. He never forgot that in his own work of going beyond his ego. So again, what have you learned? What have I learned, Jamal, from my father? Can I honor that? Okay, the last thing I want to say before I do meditation on, uh, on father is let us also honor with utmost sacredness any feelings of woundings, pain, sadness, neglect, abandonment I have had in my relationship with my father. Those feelings of pain, of sadness, woundings are also very sacred. The Quran says, all feelings, I repeat, all feelings are sacred. If they have an edge, it's only because they're separated from you. And it has an edge because it is begging you, begging you, begging you to acknowledge them, to embrace them, envelop them with your compassion, with your love. Bring them into you and integrate them. That's why I, I quote Carl Jung all the time. Will you, Jamal, have the grace and courage to kiss the demons and dragons within you. That is how they turn into a prince or princess. So this meditation is about taking you into your sacred sanctuary, a place of absolute safety, beauty, infinite possibilities. Your father is dead or alive. You summon your father there. 
not only is your father arriving there, but also your father's soul. And souls love the truth. And in this place, in the sacred sanctuary, in the invisible world, you have the power and the beauty and the healing vibrations to express whatever it is you want to your father. If you have hate, anger, express it. The only consequences are healing, as long as it is the truth of what you're feeling. If you're feeling love, express it. You see, you cannot do that on this level of reality. It has consequences. In the invisible realm, the only consequences are, if it's coming from the truth within you, it creates healing on all sides. It creates sacred vibrations on all sides. So I'll guide you through this meditation. So let's just become very still for a few moments. And just close your eyes. And then please focus on your nostril. And simply breath as you inhale, as you exhale, just this much. Being present with your in breath and out breath. Okay, letting go of this, eyes still closed. Please focus on your heart. It's a magical organ, magical space. And now, as I count numbers from 10 to one, at the count of one, find yourself ushered into your sacred sanctuary. This is a place in your imaginal world. Okay, focusing on the heart. Coming closer to your sacred sanctuary, 10. Going deeper to the heart, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Please find yourself usher into your sacred sanctuary. Could be indoors, outdoors, but it is a place that is absolutely safe. Safe. Please look around you. Feel, sense, see how beautiful it is. Majestic. Our souls love beauty. In this place, there is no judgment, only compassion, mercy, gentleness, love, healing. Go and touch something in this place and feel its texture. Whatever you do here is perfect. And don't forget, this is a place of infinite possibilities. You can summon anybody. You can fly here if you want to. So for now, just be present there. And now become very, very still. Remember, this is a safe place, beautiful, infinite possibilities. And now, 
summon your father who could be alive or who has passed on. And look up ahead. There is your father with his soul. You can greet him however you want to. This is your place. I repeat, your father is there and your father's essence, soul and souls love the truth. So be there with your father and give yourself permission to feel whatever comes up. Every feeling is sacred. It doesn't matter what it is. Love, affection, anger, sadness. They are all sacred. Their energies, vibrations. Feel them. I tell myself I have permission to feel, to experience those feelings or the feeling and empowerment. A few more seconds, allowing myself, allowing yourself to really feel any feelings which come up, honor them by experiencing them, becoming aware of them. And now, hear your father's soul. And souls love the truth telling you, telling you, please express to your father, tell your father, whatever is in your mind and heart, it doesn't matter what it is. Souls love the truth. So now with feeling, in sincerity, in purity, in truthfulness, express whatever needs to be said fully. It is healing for you and your father. And you put feeling into it. Expressing fully. Souls love the truth. As part of what you're saying, your father's soul requests you to ponder on what is your sacred prayer? What is it you want vis-a-vis -vis your father? What is your sacred prayer? For you and your father at this time. 
ponder on that. Reflect on that. What is my sacred prayer? What is it I want? Only when you're ready, express it. The universe is listening. Spirit is listening. Your father's soul is listening. Your soul is listening. But always add a sentence at the end. This or whatever is in my highest interest is manifesting for me now. This or whatever is in my highest interest is manifesting now. And gently bring this to a close. Keep your eyes closed in the sanctuary. Your father is there, father's soul is there. But finishing with this part, take your time. And now the other part, which is again gazing, looking at your father, allowing yourself to feel whatever comes up. But from the heart, acknowledging. Acknowledging that this person has been or is your father in this lifetime. It's part of a larger, mysterious story. But from the heart, acknowledging. He has been or is your father in this lifetime. From the heart. And then please allow for a beautiful sacred ritual to evolve. If you see cords that tie you to your father that are unnecessary, you have the power, you have the ability here in a cosmic way to cut those cords that frees you, releases you from any attachment which you feel is unhealthy. But you also have the power in the ritual to establish fresh cords rooted in spirit only if you want to just allow for a beautiful ritual of letting go of healing of connecting whatever is indicated to arise and participate in that please if you want to let go of something Whatever you cut, release, untie, releases you. And I repeat, you have the power to establish fresh cords, divine light between your heart and the heart of your father, soul to soul, rooted in spirit. And gently bringing this to a close. Just be there again in the sanctuary. Your father in front of you, your father's soul is there. And your father's soul 
thanks you, thanks you and blesses you. Please receive that thanks, accept those blessings. And then ask your permission to be released into the embrace of spirit. You give permission and ever so gently, ever so gently, you allow your father, your father's soul, to move into the embrace of spirit. And just be there very, very still in the sanctuary, centered, tranquil, present. As I count numbers coming into awareness, number one slowly, easily, gently coming into awareness. Number two, feeling a sense of inner spaciousness inside of you. Number three, feeling a sense of gratitude for this connection with someone who is or was your father in a way that is deeply healing and empowering for both of you. Number four, becoming aware that you are the beloved of the beloved. All is perfectly well, no matter how it seems. And number five, at your convenience, ever so gently, Opening your eyes, I'll do this Bismillah chant. Bismillah rahman rahim Bismillah rahman rahim La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah 